the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Karen, would you call the roll, please? Ms. Oglis? Here. Mr. Buffard? Here. Mr. Paul? Here. Mr. Mazur? Here. Mr. DuPont? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. McGee? Our next item on the agenda this evening is the approval of minutes of August 25, 2014. I move to approve. Second. We have a second. Ms. Aguas. Uh, is there any discussion? No. Seeing none, all in favor? I show that to be unanimous. Item number four this evening, Anthony Vale Way, Norman Baruby Builders. Request a final subdivision review for a three-lot subdivision on Sarah Liberty Lane. Mr. Chase, could you introduce this, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This says, uh, the title indicated is a three-lot subdivision in the RF zone in town uh, off of Sarah Liberty uh, Lane and private ways being proposed to access the three lots. As board members may recall, you've seen this item a number of times, held public comment on two or three occasions. Um, there, um, the board had principal design review items were around uh, street design and stormwater. Uh, at the board's <coughs> August 4th meeting, this item was uh, received preliminary approval um, and moved to a consent item for this evening's agenda um, once the applicant had addressed some of the remaining questions, which staff has reviewed and found uh, consistent with the board's expectations. Um, I will note that the board will have received an email from Kimberly Lehman. Uh, it was dated Sunday. You should have a paper copy before you when you arrive today. Um, just addressing some comments regarding the subdivision. And with that, Mr. Chair, I turn it back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, this is a consent item, but if the applicant is here and would like to make a comment, we would entertain that. No comments, Chairman. Jay's presentation wrapped up the final points that we had. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> At this point, I would like to make a motion um, to approve the application of Norman Baruby Builders, Inc. under Chapter 406, the Town of Scarborough Subdivision Ordinance, for the final plan of Anthony Vale Way Subdivision. I'm stopping, and I apologize to the board. Board, no, uh, we actually have five voting members this evening. Susan, you're not a voting member this oh. evening. Um, while it is a consent item, I do still want to give the board the opportunity to make comment before we actually go to the motion phase. So I will open it up to the board and ask Mr. Mazur if he'd like to start us. No, we've gone through it all. Okay. A to, a to Z. <coughs> Mr. DuPont. Agree. Mr. Powers. I actually do have a couple comments. Um, I was not here for the August 4th meeting, uh, but I did watch the proceedings on, uh, on video on the website. Um, as I had expressed at the meeting prior to that, um, I had a lot of concerns about the engineering, uh, the stormwater engineering on this project. Not the engineering per se, but the underlying conditions and the history of issues here. Um, and much like Ms. Ogla stated at the August 4th meeting, um, while I certainly <coughs> respect the opinions and conclusions of the, the peer reviewer and, and the town's engineer, that this uh, meets sort of the baseline threshold requirements um, in that uh, they, in their opinion, believe that this will not uh, do harm to the existing, um, to the neighbors there, and uh, therefore be problematic under the ordinance. Um, as Ms. Agus also pointed out, there have been times when we've um, not disregarded, but have weighed those sorts of opinions and conclusions and have decided to go in another direction based on our own uh, experience and opinions, and this is one of those for me. Um, it's been stated on a number of occasions uh, that it's sort of in support of the of the pr proposed project. That um, well, you know, that, that this applicant is doing a lot to engineer this to try and improve the situation and get the water to go in the right direction. And I don't dispute that, and I I do commend the applicant and their team for doing everything they can. Um, 
and it appears to me they will get their approval here tonight, but I, I can't vote in support of it. Um, my, I sort of uh, take the, the, op the other spin on the level of engineering here and say that um, that to me says that everything has to go absolutely right. There's very little room for error here, and um, the, the implications if things don't go well could be, could be unfortunate um, for, for people in that area. Um, you know, we not too uncommonly have applicants come back to us after projects have been approved and say, oh, gee, you know, we <coughs> this line ended up, ended up being, you know, two, you know, two inches in the wrong direction this way or this didn't get built quite right and now we need to kind of have this amended after the fact. I'm not saying that, that this team won't do what they said they will do and I certainly hope they will if this gets approved, but <coughs> to me, I just, you know, given the, um, the potential downside here and the fact that there's a lot that has to be done perfectly to kind of shoehorn three, uh, three lots into this area that has had a lot of issues. Um, I just uh, don't think I can support it, but thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Buffard. Thank you. Uh, I've expressed my opposition to this before, and I <clears throat> I'm still opposed to it. Uh, I think the margin of error is too small. Um, It wouldn't take much to uh, um, adding three lots and a road to this subdivision, I think, is a bad idea. Uh, they already have existing problems with water problems, and I think this, is, this may or may not add to that, but I think, again, I think the uh, possibility is there and the margin of error is, is, is Simply too small for me to uh, to go along with it, so I'm opposed to this. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ivins. I think it's quite clear that from the beginning, I have felt as if this was pushing the limits. I understand the um, purpose for and most of the um, legalities of building in wetlands. I think this pushes every button we've got. I don't think it's going to work. I would like very much to encourage the um, planning department, especially the part of our department that makes sure that everything that they said they're going, to do, they're going to do is done absolutely to premium. Um, if I could vote, I'd vote no, but I can't vote, so I'll just say I'm not here to approve this. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chair? Yes. I'd like to... Uh, respond to some of the other board members. Do you have a chance to do that? Oh, I'm sorry. Does he yeah. have a chance? Okay. Absolutely. It's discussion. Okay. Do you have a problem with that, uh -oh. Susan? Just making sure. Go for it. Okay. The, uh, the applicant, we had the same concerns <coughs> expressed about the applicant when he proposed his project off of Highland Avenue about wetlands and impinging on other properties in the concerns that the neighbors had. And uh, to date, to the best of my knowledge, there have been no complaints about the new project off of Highland Avenue uh, that the same applicant uh, has uh, implemented. And uh, so uh, my feeling is that uh, uh, they will follow letter to the law exactly what they've ex expressed based on past experience. Thank you. All right. Um, this has been one of the more interesting developments that we've had come in front of us, and given the fact that it's only three lots, um, and you know the, the amount of passion that I have seen from the board, one way or another, I think has been actually it's been great, um, and. I guess the area that I've struggled with a little bit is I have not been able to put my finger on that one thing that I felt that I could um, say the applicant has not done in order to be able to actually get the project approved. I don't, in the past, we have not always approved items for various reasons because we didn't think that they either met the ordinances that were involved, or they did, or whatever the case might be. Um, sometimes we've uh, erred on the side of safety 
Um, I, I'm struggling, I guess, as to what of those reasons that I can put my finger on that would say this applicant has not met the intent of the ordinance. So uh, I totally respect the feeling of my fellow board members and their opinion on the item. Um, and um, at this point, I guess I am not of the same opinion that they are that it will not work. And I'm actually putting my faith in the hands of the engineers and more so in the hands of the inspectors that will be uh, involved in this process as this, pro this project potentially gets built out so that everything does actually get installed the way it needs to get installed. And I think that there's enough focus that's on this that staff um, will do uh, the due diligence that's required in order to try to make sure that we get things done. So. Um, I guess from my perspective, I, I can't find an item in the ordinance to put my finger on that says this isn't being met. So I'm struggling with uh, the ability to deny the applicant. So I don't know if there's any additional comments or not from board members. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might just add, um, just to, because I know not everyone maybe on the board and certainly in the audience is aware of sort of what the town does after an approval. There is a, a third party inspection process that occurs um, for sort of infrastructure development as well as this item has triggered our post-construction stormwater infrastructure um, ordinance. So there's also an as-built requirement for that. Um, I might offer that if board members have concerns that um, that you really want to highlight the issues that were raised with regards to ensuring that um, you know the lot grading is done exactly to spec uh, we could consider adding an additional condition um, that's um, I know that you I provide you with draft conditions but we could mm -hmm. consider adding a, an additional condition um, if, if folks are so inclined Okay. Susan? I don't have anything like that. I just think that this is an example of why we sit here. I mean, we are here to state our concerns, and I agree with the chair in that there's no reason why we can't, according to the ordinances, grant this <clears throat> application. But I also depend upon the rest of the planning board, uh, not the planning board, the rest of the planning department to make sure that everything that happens happens according to what it is we've okayed. And if that happens, there's really nothing else we can do. And I expect that will occur. So thank you for that very much. All right. Dave? I'm just thinking <clears throat> you can do all the studies, um, get all the experts to look at uh, the issues you could plug all the numbers into a computer model, and the model may tell you everything will be fine, but uh, computer models are not always correct. Experts are not always correct. Uh, personally, <clears throat> I guess I'm going based on my gut, okay. and I just don't think uh, this project is going to end well, so I'm opposed to it. Oh, I Totally respect that. Any other comments? Well, my only other comment would be that I, I'm not going to make any predictions about whether the project will turn out well. I, I hope it does. I certainly wouldn't want to. I hope, I hope that uh, everyone who uh, is in support of the project and, and the neighbors are, are vindicated um, and that it does turn out well. But I, um, I just don't have the comfort level, given all the the evidence and history to be able to support it, but I do appreciate all the comments. I do think at a minimum that any motion that we do put in front of the board adds the provision that Mr. Chase just brought up in terms of providing any X protection that we can absolutely provide should this project pass. So I think that's a very good, valid suggestion, and um, as I make a motion, I will be sure to add that piece to it. 
Mr. Mazur, all set? Okay. Ms. Mr. DuPont? I'm fine. Okay. Then I am going to move to approve the application of Norman Berube Builders, Inc. under Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Subdivision Ordinance for the final plan for Anthony Vale Way Subdivision with the following findings and conditions. Findings. The applicant proposes a three-lot residential private way subdivision with access off Sarah Liberty Lane. The residential subdivision is located within the Rural Farming District and has been designed in accordance with the Conservation Subdivision Design Standards. The Planning Board finds that the subdivision meets the Conservation Subdivision Design Standards with an excess of 50% open space, the preservation of wetlands, and residential lots designed to meet the space and bulk regulations of Section 7A. In addition, the Planning Board finds that the subdivision meets Section 4 and 6 of the Subdivision Ordinance, ensuring that the development meets minimum standards for the public, of, excuse me, for the protection of public health, safety, and welfare. Waivers. The Planning Board waived the standard road design requirement for road width and hammerhead design in consideration of the roadway and infrastructure associated with the development are to remain private. Conditions. The subdivision shall be developed in accordance with the subdivision plans entitled Plan of Private Way and Final Plan Anthony Way Anthony Vale Way Conservation Subdivision prepared by BH2M dated November 2013, revised August 1914, sheets one through six. Prior to the release of the attested final division, subdivision plan to the applicant for recording at the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds, the traffic impact fees in the amount of $998.10 shall be paid to the planning department. Prior to the release of the attested final subdivision plan to the applicant for recording at the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds, the applicant shall execute and record all documentation necessary to comply with the town's post-construction stormwater infrastructure management ordinance. Prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for lots one, two, and three, the required demarcation of the vegetated buffers shall be installed. A recreation fee in the amount of $250 shall be paid prior to the issuance of each building permit. And finally, to ensure the construction site inspections and, and. and as built certification includes all elements of the plans including lot grading, stormwater facilities, and all infrastructure apparatus. I think that's apparatus. It is. All right. <laughs> is there a second? A question. You said uh, Chapter 405. On our sheets, we have 406. If I said 405, that's my error. It is 406. Thank you. I'll second. We have a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? All opposed? I show that three in favor, two opposed. The motion is passed. Our next item this evening is Sawgrass Subdivision Star Homes Inc. requests for final subdivision review for a 24 lot subdivision off Sawyer Road. Mr. Chase. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Board members uh, will recall we last saw this item, I believe it was in January when it received its preliminary approval. Um, since that time, um, as is often the case, the applicant have been working through their stormwater permit with the DEP, uh, which um, I'll have the applicant's engineer sort of describe the details of, of, what, of the outcome, but essentially the proposed uh, gravel wetland uh, approach that they had uh, taken to their stormwater management was found to be deficient based on existing conditions at the site. So in the subsequent months, uh, the applicant has worked to try to figure out how to resolve this issue and, and met with staff on a number of occasions as they worked through the issues to find an uh, alternative design 
that would function for the site as well as for the town. Um, and as I said, I think I'll leave the sort of details of the approach to be described by the applicant, but uh, suffice it to say at this point, public works, the town engineer, planning department are generally comfortable with the approach that's being taken. Um, there are still some detail items that we think need to be flushed out, as you can see in our uh, reports that were generated by Woodard and Kern and by Jim Wendell and by planning staff. But as I said, I think ostensibly we're, we're comfortable with the direction we're headed uh, with the stormwater facilities. Um, another item that's changed since the board last saw this, the applicant, uh, the, net, uh, the applicant was uh, Preliminary approval is a 23 lot subdivision. At this time, the applicant is now proposing a 24 lot subdivision. The net residential density by regular calculation, if you will, allows for 23 lots. However, the applicant is taking advantage of the affordable housing density bonuses that are provided for in the VR4 zone. Um, and so he's looking to add a 24th lot. So that's changed some of the lot configuration, but overall, ostensibly, the layout is generally the same. Um, but I just wanted to bring that to the board's attention. Um, one thing that has changed, uh, and I think you know, sort of precipitated due in large part to the change in the stormwater approach uh, at the DEP level, is uh, the <coughs> arrangement or location of the readily accessible open space. As board members may recall, uh, we worked through the VR4 has seven village development standards that need to be met. Um, you work through a number of them, including sidewalks, interconnected streets, and the like, to really ostensibly get to this design. However, one of the ones uh, it requires that 10 to 20 percent of the open space be provided as readily accessible active green spaces. The intent there is the VR4 allows for higher density development on much smaller lots, not a lot of yard space. So the intent is to provide uh, active play space, if you will, for the residents. Um, and to that end, the applicant has, as I said before, given the rearrangement of the stormwater facilities, has relocated some of the uh, the preponderance of that active play space. There's a, there's a small component sort of in the middle of the subdivision and then a second larger component behind a few of the lots. Um, and so that's just another design element uh, for the board and applicant to understand. Um, outside of that, um, just point out that it appears that one of the lots uh, doesn't meet the town's frontage standards. It's a essentially need to carry um, a minor lot line tweak that would need to occur. It looks like there's plenty of lot area there for it to occur, but um, it is a, a change to the plans that would need to be made uh, to make, I believe it's lot 19 conforming. Um, I can talk through that detail if anyone's interested. Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, in addition to staff comments, planning staff comments, you'll have received a memo from Jim Wendell as well as from Winter and Kern on this issue. Um, and with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Good evening and welcome, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Planning Board. Um, I'm here tonight, uh, Sawgrass Subdivision for Star Homes. Joe Prestacci is here tonight as the applicant. Uh, as Jay indicated, we're here as 24 single-family house lots in the VR4, which is the village residential zone. Uh, when we received the preliminary approval, we had a 23-lot subdivision, uh, and we took a look at the affordable housing provision or allowance that uh, could come into play here. I'll have, in, in a little bit, I'll have Joe come up and uh, Joe Pistacci and, and, and discuss his uh, workings with the town manager and how that lot, uh, which we show uh, near lot 19 as the uh, additional 24th lot. Uh, from the preliminary approval moving forward, I've just outlined some of the things that we obviously have accomplished. And then I'd like to go through. My last submission was August 29th to the planning staff and point out a few of the things Jay mentioned. Uh, we do have approval from Scarborough Sanitary District. The on-site uh, pressure sewer system connecting out onto Sawyer Road is, is approved as designed in all the details. Portland Water District has reviewed uh, the design, <coughs> excuse me, um, main DEP. That was the big one, the stormwater permit. Uh, we have that. Uh, submission has been given to the, to the uh, planning office for that. And I'm going to have in a little while have Andy Morrill uh, get up and talk about the stormwater 
uh, design and how it has changed since we were uh, last here for, for a preliminary. <coughs> one other item is the traffic impact fee that's assessed to the each lot. We've added one lot, so that assessment will be updated to reflect maybe another $200 impact fee, but that uh, was submitted back to my traffic engineer uh, on Friday. So I should have that, and again, it's just, uh, it doesn't change the, the, the results or anything in the report other than there's one more lot, a few more trips off site, and that'll be assessed a, uh, an impact fee as the other 23 lots are. Uh, another thing was certification of the existing, there's an existing 72 inch culvert underneath the gravel road that accesses this site. Uh, Jim Wendell, as part of his memo, um, asked for certification that it will meet the conditions and the standards for a road culvert. Uh, I've had Shirtleft uh, company out there, uh, looked at it, it certainly meets and exceeds any of the ASTRO standards. Uh, we do need to add a, or order a 10-foot piece to make our full 53-foot uh, crossing as that has been permitted also by DEP. <clears throat> so the good thing is the culvert is there, it's the quality and the condition that the town, the public works and the town engineer was hoping it was. Um, as Jay indicated when we were here for preliminary approval, we had a um, stormwater process for, for treatment was through a, a, a wetland pond design uh, that has uh, been found to be not economical due to some soil conditions that would be down below where these ponds were going to be built. It was a very fluid clay. Um, you can build on anything you want as long as you've got lots of money and to stabilize that and make that work uh, for the wetland pond design um, didn't make sense. So we've got a, uh, <clears throat> a different design for that, which I'll have uh, Andy in a little bit come up and point that out. On the uh, <coughs> design, as Jay has pointed out, um, lot 1819, the lot line between the two, uh, the ordinance says we need to maintain 50 feet of, of lot width through the front setback. This line is going off at an angle. I need to come down here by five or six feet and then back. So that will, <clears throat> will make lot 19 uh, conform to, to the zoning. So that, again, real small, small change. The other thing with the, the wetland pond design, uh, we're going to be in this area here. Uh, by eliminating that and going with what we'll, the focal point uh, treatments, which we'll go into in a minute, it freed this area up um, so that it was not needed for stormwater uh, detention or ponds in any way. So we've created this along with this corner piece as the village open space. We've exceeded the 10% from the net uh, residential number, which is down here in the plan. So we've generated uh, the opportunity for the for the homeowners association or the homeowners and the homeowners association to generate um, whatever they might like. We have an easement coming in uh, trail and can come back out through here to Sumac Lane. Um, this area here is, is designated as an access easement for this uh, community. Gardens, picnic tables, the homeowners can, can generate the type of use and to the level that they uh, uh, feel it fits the neighborhood. Uh, if we have uh, fires with, with kids, you might want to focus on one type of improvement. If you have older folks, uh, they may not want uh, swings or, or something that, uh, that wouldn't be used by uh, an older generation. So um, <clears throat> otherwise, the, like Jay said, the little little change, the, actually the, the new lot came out of this area here. Uh, the affordable lot that uh, is now the 24th lot in this project uh, is, a, is assigned to lot one, first lot in uh, to the project. <clears throat> I'd like to go through um, Jay and, um, and Jim Wendell's comments. Um, to show you, you know, basically what what we propose. Most of it was little notes. I call it construction notes, uh, clarifying. Um, you know, Jim Wendell has has his process and his uh, level of, of uh, comfort, I guess, with, <laughs> with uh, certain things. So, on Sumac Lane, uh, the intersection of Sumac Lane at that corner, we had widened out the pavement. Uh, Jim wants a conventional uh, pavement width of 20 feet through there. Um, and we've adjusted the um, sewer and water to stay within that roadway system. Uh, he had a, an issue with a little slight cover over a couple of pipes coming out of a catch basin. Again, in that intersection, um, he asked that the certification of the culvert be done, which we have done. Uh, on the Sawyer Road, we are going to be uh, 
putting a sidewalk in, curb, and in that process there will be a new catch basin installed, which is all detailed in the plans. And Jim asked that we do a test pit uh, for that culvert, excuse me, the catch basin installation, just to make sure we know where everything is. But as part of the construction, also dig safe will be out there as a standard procedure, uh, marking any of the utilities. Jim asked for another note on the underground cables that they all be in conduit, which is standard. Uh, the light pole detail is a town detail, so I got to ask him uh, what he has for an issue with that. Sidewalk ramps, all of that's detailed on sheet 11. Um, those notes were there, and I'll just point them out to to uh, Jim when when he gets my response to this, which I sent back to him on September 9th. Uh, planting selection, we have the focal point treatment, which again Andy will go into. Uh, Jim asked that the plants be selected prior to final approval. Well, the process and the notes on the plan uh, indicate, you know, there's probably like six pages of plants that you can put in these treatment systems. Uh, and the standard procedure is to, when we start building them, you see where your sites are, what might be more tolerant to different things. And the notes on the plan say that that will be approved uh, and accepted by the town engineer. So that's, you know, typically how we do that. So <clears throat> those are uh, basically the responses to Jim. Uh, Jay had a memo um, based on our August 29th uh, submission, and again, some things with some notes he wanted uh, clarified. Um, <coughs> he has stated the stormwater treatment, the staff is generally comfortable with it. The affordable housing, uh, Jay, uh, Joe will, will talk to that, how we feel that that works and how it falls within the uh, zoning ordinance. Uh, Jay wants that referenced as a note, how we got the 24th lot against the zoning that, that uh, doesn't allow it without that provision. So we'll add a note to the, to the plan just to clarify that. <coughs> lot 19, the 50-foot frontage width, I just uh, described that to you. And uh, a written description on recreation improvements. And I, I, I can do that. We've, we've highlighted or, or, or spoken this, uh, today on, on what we want. We kind of want to have the homeowners uh, dictate what happens out there. We've, we've got plenty of uh, recreation area or a village green space, if you will. In addition, the open space uh, that's left undisturbed uh, offers the opportunity for walking, uh, snowshoeing, or any other passive recreation that the homeowners so choose. Uh, a lot of blueberries out there. They go blueberry picking on that season and, and uh, have an opportunity to, to use the land as they, as they see is the best fit. So. The two things I mentioned, I guess, Joe, if we could just talk a little bit about the affordable housing, uh, how that worked, and then have Andy talk about the uh, focal point uh, treatment systems. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Joe Fastacci. I'm the developer. First, I want to apologize for my cell phone going off. I got here at 7, at 6.30. I think the meeting was at 6, 6.30. I went back in the car, put it in my pocket. I apologize. The affordable house um, is something that I did talk to um, the town manager, and I was quite surprised with the limits that are allowed. It's a sliding scale. It's based on income and the size of the family. Uh, it is my intention to address the lower limits, uh, probably a family of three, uh, being somewhere around 250 to $275,000 for a sale price of the house. That is on the lower limits. He said you can go as high as 365000 That's not my intention of affordable house, not my uh, opinion. So we're going to keep it in the lower level uh, the best we can. We have been talking to uh, uh, a few people that would uh, qualify based on income and the size of the family in that price range. So that's, uh, that is our goal. We're leaving it as an open lot, not designated one particular lot. Um, and we do re understand that the requirement is the house does not look uh, any different than the existing houses in the neighborhood. So uh, we keep that in mind when we build the house, and uh, hopefully it blends in nicely. Uh, secondly, the um, uh, open space. Is that another issue that uh, uh, we were thinking? Initially, I was thinking of doing a, a playground area, uh, but because of the number of people that have contacted me regarding this uh, subdivision, um, we didn't think that was a good idea because a lot of people were um, 
middle income, uh, uh, middle aged, and no kids, empty nesters, or whatever, and, and they weren't excited about swings and stuff and being responsible for it. So we're allowing the homeowners association to decide what actually would go in there. We will have probably some rocks uh, where kids can climb. Uh, as Bill mentioned, uh, the land does afford itself for uh, uh, snow ski, um, uh, cross-country skiing, snowshoes. Uh, one thing that I will do is I'll provide an area for Victory Gardens, gardens uh, for the family owners to um, uh, do some plantings um, and um, basically let them decide what they want to do with, with the open space. Bill mentioned that there's several uh, easements to access uh, access the uh, open space, and uh, we will we will mark those so that uh, there's a way for the people to walk through without uh, feeling uncomfortable about walking through someone's uh, property. Um, I guess that's uh, Andy's up with the with the other, and I'll be available for questions later. All right, real quickly, I'll go over the, uh, these new focal point systems. Um, as Bill mentioned, we had previously had a gravel wetland design on the site. Um, that design wasn't, uh, wasn't economical. We uh, went back to the drawing board, uh, worked with the DEP and the town. What were our options to handle stormwater on the site? Um, what we came up with was a relatively new, uh, I guess I'd call it green approach, uh, relatively recently approved best management practices pro process by the DEP. It's a, called a focal point biofiltration system. Uh, those of you familiar with the Filtera uh, system, it's, it's basically the same system minus the concrete structure. Basically what it is is a system that runs concurrently with your closed drainage system in the street and the low flow storms flow into an area off of the road. So there's a break in the curb along the side of the road upstream of the catch basins so that the small storms will flow through this outlet over some stones where the uh, energy will be dissipated. It will flow into a low area, typically around 30 square feet in size. Uh, they range in size from 30 to 60 square feet, but most of them are 30 square feet in size. Uh, in this low area, the flow will infiltrate into the ground. There's um, 18 inches of a filter media uh, where the runoff will filtrate through the ground, remove the pollutants. There's an underdrain system at the bottom that collects the runoff, dumps it back into the street system in the street. Down the street system it goes where it's outleted down at the stream. Uh, two other features of the system, there is a uh, beehive grave at the top of the structure so that during significant storms if the, the runoff backs up a little bit in this area, it's collected in the beehive grate, can't get deeper than six inches, flows back again to the street system and out. During the uh, more significant storms, the, the 25, 50 year storm, the break in the curb will be, the water will run past that and flow directly into the catch basin in the street and through the system. So it's, uh, it's a, a very unique system, something that's, uh, I think, uh, you're going to see a lot of more of in the future, these type of systems. Uh, maintenance of this system is, is quite simple. It's uh, the top layer of the focal point area is covered with a bark mulch or something similar material. Uh, on a yearly basis, that material will have to be removed and replaced. All this sediment will build up in that top six inches of bark mulch. And when that sediment and, and bark mulch is removed, the sediment will all be removed with it. Uh, other than that, it's a, a pretty simple system. So um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that anybody may have. Bill, is that the end of the presentation? Sure. Um, Mr. Fellows, would you like to begin? Sure. Thanks. Um, I don't really have a whole lot. I mean, a lot of this we've gone through um, at some length uh, over the past few months. Um, one question, just building on the on, on the uh, on the last part of the presentation: What is the presumption in terms of uh, 
responsibility for maintaining the bark mulch and you know what what sort of mechanism uh, organizationally would be in place to make sure that that happens. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've had a, a series of meetings with, with the town uh, to discuss these n unique and, and new uh, stormwater treatment structures. They, they will be located within the right-of-way, and the applicant's intent would be to eventually uh, hand this road over to the town as a, a public road, at which time the, the town would take over maintenance and, and ownership of these structures. Um, so we've gone, uh, we've met with Public Works and, and the town engineer and, and gone over these systems and actually had a presentation from Fabco Industries, the company who, f who manufactures these, and uh, went over the maintenance requirements of them. Uh, the company who will be providing these structures will actually provide the maintenance for the first year, and then uh, after that it would be uh, the town's responsibility if and when it's accepted as a, a public road. Up until that point, it will be the applicant or the homeless association maintaining them. Uh, Jay? Yeah, if I could just jump in there. Um, my, just to give board members a little bit of background, then come to the the, the point that I want to make. Typically, um, this is a little bit different approach than the town typically takes with stormwater facilities. Um, past practice has always been to keep stormwater maintenance facilities out of the public's right away. Right. You know, the only items that we want in the public's right away are to be the public's responsibility, not sort of others' responsibilities. Um, staff, as I said, had a number of meetings with the applicant and understanding that the approach to managing stormwater is evolving and it's evolving rather quickly in the last couple of years, frankly. Um, focus used to be largely on the quantity of water. Really more focus is being turned attention onto quality of storm water. And uh, the town is recon uh, recognizes that, you know, given our work with the Long Creek watershed and the Red Brook watershed and really doing some more localized stormwater management thinking critical thinking, um, as I mentioned, we, we sort of realize that there are these new approaches that are, are, are coming down the pike and are being accepted. One thing that we've talked about in this application, um, however, as I recall the conversation with the public works director, is, is that these things are still relatively new. And the concern of the town is understanding the maintenance and operation, the ongoing maintenance and operation costs in particular. Again, typically the town has allowed pipes in the public right away, but the actual treatment areas have been out of the right away, and they have not been the town's responsibility. So the cost burden has been on the developer. And that is the agreement that I sort of recall we came to with this was that, okay, staff is recon recognizes these changes we'd be comfortable recognizing, of course, that the acceptance of a street in any infrastructure is ultimately the council's decision, but staff, the town engineer, public works department do make their recommendations, stating that, you know, at this point what the position that uh, we took was we would be comfortable going to the council with a recommendation to accept the street once it's built, and presuming it's built to all the right specs, provided, however, that the ongoing maintenance and operation of these focal points remain the responsibility of the homeowners association. So that's a little bit different than what I was, what I was hearing uh, Mr. Morrill speak to, and I want to be sure that we're clear on that point moving forward, because at this point that's the town's position. If the applicant would like to take another position on it, then I think we need to have some more conversation around that. Again, ultimately this is the council's decision. You know, staff can recommend whatever they choose and council can adopt whatever they choose. But um, uh, so I just think that point needs a little bit further. You're, you're exactly right, Jay, there. I, I, I misspoke and I apologize. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting worried. <laughs> I thought we had a note on the plan to. to we, we do. Okay. Yes. All right. So, so let me just make sure I understand. Yes, please the do. The ongoing maintenance of the stormwater system will be. Homeowner association. association, and any cost for that maintenance will be the 
homeowners association. The Correct. town will ex hopefully accept this as being there, but the maintenance of it is not going to be up to the town. That is correct. Oh, I'm so glad you told me that. Yeah. Thank you. And beyond uh, that, further, further on that, easement to be able to <coughs> maintain it. Right. Gotcha. Right. Jay, Makes sense. Is is that in writing yet? It will be. Yeah. I remembered the notation. I thought we went back and forth on the notation to clarify this point, and that's why I was. A, and so I'm. I'm looking at it now, and I believe it's here under note 27, if I'm not mistaken. Jay, I, I, I recall your email, and you're absolutely right. And I think we immediately put it into our homeowners association documents that the homeowners will be responsible for that. The estimated cost, this end is a couple of yards of, uh, of, of mulch and a couple of hours' worth of work. So it's not a lot of money. If all goes well and the creek don't rise. <laughs> well, if the creek rises over there, we're in serious trouble. But no, uh, it, it is addressed in the homeowners' documents, and and uh, uh, we understand that. And, and and just to further that point, the note actually, I remember it's my staff comments I flagged that we need to change this note to reflect the conversation. So the current notes that we have don't reflect the agreement, and that was one of my staff comments that this note needs to be revised and. Yeah. But I, be I believe I believe we put that into the homeowners' documents that that's responsibility along with the open space, the uh, yeah. the garden. So but we'd like to see it on the plans as well, Joe. Mm -hmm. That's not a problem. That's that's not a problem at all. How do we how do we enforce this on the association ten years down the road? What's the mechanism for the town to make? Well, we have our if they don't do it. We have, there will be, so a couple things. They'd be in violation of their approved plan, and um, so the town could presumably take, um, you know, uh, zoning violation, and then, presum you know, if they sort of keep pushing back, if you will, and the association doesn't exist, the community could take court action, potentially. Um, hopefully it wouldn't come to that. Um, we do have, I'll get back to, this site is also, um, going to be subject to our post-construction stormwater infrastructure management ordinance. So there is an annual reporting that will need to be done. Um, and so June 1st of every year, we, get, we will receive a report that a third-party inspector has gone out, looked at, the, looked at the elements, and either identified something needs to be done, and if it does, what corrective actions will be taken. Um, so there is that annual reporting on these items. Um, and we do know that there is an annual maintenance cost to these items, and that's specifically why the town is, at this point, uh, you know, without really understanding those ongoing costs and operational needs of these items, um, not prepared to support a recommendation in council to support, uh, to accept these in the town's, uh, or as part of the town's uh, assets. I believe that there's language in the homeowners uh, association documents that um, allow the homeowners association to lien the property to this legal language to collect monies and just like any other homeowners documents that come that require uh, assessments, yearly assessments, maintenance, whether it's a private road, it's the same language. If not, we'll make sure that it's there. I'm sure your legal staff will. Uh, they've already re re reviewed these, haven't they, uh, Jay? We've yeah. taken a look at the, yeah. the draft. Yeah, and the comments. Yep. The, yeah. We have addressed all Suggest comments. Suggest we make it a condition of approval. But the um, language is there. The, when the note, I guess, um, the note will be clearly revised on the plan, so that will appear with, your ne with the next submission, I guess, staff, at this point. Um, if the board's considering a motion tonight? No, I don't just, no my suggestion is that when we do move forward with mm -hmm. this project that we might consider as a condition of approval um, that staff approve the language in the association document yeah, sure. just to make sure that it, sure. it is we've in re conjunction with what's on the plan. Yep, and we've received a, a draft of that uh, already. Yep. So Presumably okay. by the next meeting we can have, if there are any remaining issues, but I, but we have 
Okay, okay. have that ironed out. But, but yeah, yep. just so that Understood. we're in alignment between yep. the association document and what we're physically putting on the plan and approving. That's all. Okay. Yeah, I think I I agree that that's important, and I, I sort of the same question about how you enforce that. And I think that you know there are some cases sometimes where these homeowners association documents become dead letters where they just sort of recorded and nobody ever looks at them again. But I think it it, it seems like in this case there's a there's a really affirmative plan to make sure that there's follow through with the post construction plan and so forth. And I do agree that uh, having that approval of the association language as a condition would make sense. Um, so I'm glad we asked that and got that clarified for sure. Um, beyond that, on the affordable housing, I'm encouraged to hear that that um, sounds like there's potentially some demand and as I'm sure the applicant knows that's been kind of a kind of a, a recurring challenge in town uh, where there have been a lot of good intentions and had a hard time getting things actually built and, and sold to eligible buyers. So hopefully um, hopefully that will come together in this case. And um, aside from that, I think at least uh, for my, uh, to my mind, we've, we've covered the overall site layout uh, and subdivision issues pretty well. And uh, it sounds like the applicants responded to some of the, the staff comments is in the, in, and is in the process of doing so and some others, and there's some housekeeping. Um, so beyond that, I think that's all I have. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I could add to one more <coughs> comment uh, sure. that, that was made. Uh, in addition to Homeowners Association, which, again, has been formed, or not formed, but submitted as a draft, the note can be added to the plan. The DEP stormwater permit also includes operations and maintenance of this whole system. So there's another permit in place that if something doesn't happen, they're in violation of this stormwater permit, so in addition to the town level. So there's one more level that should, you know, put you at ease also that, that to make this work. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. John? I'm good now. All right. Ron? Yeah, I got a couple of things. Um, I heard you uh, state that the concerns that Jim Window had mentioned, uh, you sort of addressed, but is he aware of that? I mean, have you corresponded back to him about the concerns, and has he said okay? I have not heard back. His letter to me was September 8th, after my submission of August 29th. September 9th, I wrote a letter right back to him addressing how these notes could be clarified, and to some of the points weren't, weren't relevant. The, the notes were on the plan. He perhaps overlooked them. So I wanted to get it back to him quickly uh, to show him that, again, there was nothing in his response that would subject this project to to not meeting all the regulations and ordinances. So it just sort of like wordsmithing and, you know, I need a note that says this. But again, and I was, you know, very clear in my letter September 9th back to Jim with my eight items and I have not heard back from him from that point. So from next time we'll have reassurance that though he has responded to your response. And, and I, I would hope that, yes, I was hoping he'd have it responded before tonight, um, but I, I have not heard from him. Okay. Um, for staff, for Jay, some of your concerns with the lot layout, like lot 19 setbacks, have they, uh, to save time, been addressed to your satisfaction? I haven't seen revised plans. Um, I think... They're, they're relatively de minimis, I'll say. I mean, a, a non-conforming lot is not a de minimis thing, but the change to make it conforming, it's a fairly subtle change that you probably wouldn't even notice if it weren't directly pointed out to you. So I've, I have a high level of confidence that the issues with regards to setbacks and lot frontage can easily be handled between this submission and the next submission. You're aware of the concerns? Yes, I've already made the correction. Okay. But um, <coughs> That I have here. Oh, the vegetative buffering is that—that uh, that was another issue that came up in some of the correspondence between staff and us. Could you point out specifically what what comments on the vegetative buffering we were um, asked to respond to? I'm not sure what what that uh, what that question was. Um. 
between the resident residential lots and the open space. I think Mr. Mays is referring to under planning staff comments other items. Um, as I as we talked about at the outset, you sort of reorient, relocated, I should say, less reoriented, but relocated the active open space to behind lots 19 through 24. Mm -hmm. um, again, where the intent of this area is to be sort of actively engaged and utilized. Um, our, my comments referenced uh, consideration for adding some level of uh, seasonal landscaping to buffer, you know, if someone wants to be, at, so they don't feel like they're in those neighbors' backyards oh, in this, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. I don't know that, again, this is certainly at staff and applicants' discretion, but I don't know that needs to be a fully screen so you can't see anything through there, but mm -hmm. just some type of delineation so that if you choose to go back there and throw a Frisbee or softball, what mm -hmm. have you, you're not feeling like you're in someone else's backyard. Um, How do you feel about that, Joe? In the past, we've used uh, six-foot arborvitaes uh, to mark the property line. They don't take up a lot of space, but they do grow tall. If that's something that would be allowed, uh, we might use that for a, uh, a living uh, fence. Yeah, that's what you're addressing, yep. basically. That's, that's the intent. And okay. The board's what? comfortable with that approach. Okay. I Fine. see no issues okay. with it. Are the trees already on that property line now? There are trees. There are trees there. Um, Spindly. Well, there's. I actually don't know whether the spindly or whether the, we we did test pits in that area, and I know we had to knock down quite a few trees to get to it. Uh, we could probably leave some maples if there's some decent maples, some birch trees. Um, we will watch what we cut along that back line. You know, I'm just looking at you know your expense. I appreciate that. Without, uh, yeah. Planning, that's fine with yeah. Yeah. Well, we can we can do some fill in. Uh, but we, we will look at what's there and, and add to it if we have to. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. I just want to re reinforce what Jay said, you know, just so, so people don't feel it's right in their back. Correct. That, 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 Correct. That's the point. Absolutely. I to address. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm all set beyond that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And Ms. Um I'm feeling a lot better now that we're clear on the um, um, sure stormwater usage and who's going to be responsible for what. Um, make sure, I, 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 I'm always a little not paying a whole lot of attention when it comes to homeowners association <coughs> as a part of the planning board, but this is a case in which I think the homeowners association papers are very important because they are going to be responsible for what sounds like a really exciting new method of dealing with stormwater, and I think that you folks deserve a lot of credit. The town kind of prides itself on taking care of stormwater management in creative ways, but the Homeowners Association needs to have a really clear understanding of their role in this, so that makes me feel better. So the maintenance is not going to eventually go to the town, and they need to understand that it's just not going to happen. This is one of the things they're buying into from the moment they decide to buy a lot. Um, our our um, agenda says final subdivision review. Okay, this is our final review if we're lucky, but we're not ready to do anything in the way of a final approval. So we'll be seeing you again. And um, I'd like to think that even though I promise you I will not read the, stone, the, the homeowners association papers, I think they should be drawn up for staff to review in some depth. Um, the language of how that's going to appear, I think, is very important. I'm wondering about the, the, the okay, I, I approve, I, I like the idea of the Homeowners Association decides how they're going to use their open space, but I think it needs to be uh, formalized in some way. Over time, this could become an issue. It can be used for, I like the idea of Victory Gardens, I love it. Uh, cross country, blah de blah. But I think it needs to be, and I'm not even going to pretend to understand how to do this. But to just say you guys can do anything you want may work, may not work. But 
again, as part of the homeowners association papers, I think need to be looked at closely in this particular um, application. Um, Ms. Douglas, may I say yes, something in, in that regard? Um, I think my, uh, part of my memo I, I reference requesting sort of an, a written narrative. Part of that is the applicant is asking for the open space to be considered in lieu of the recreation fee. And they're ah. really, though they're, they're in the same ballpark, they're separate elements, mm -hmm. the zoning ordinance requires the open space, the right. 20 to 10 to 20 percent active open space in the neighborhood. And the town and has a separate and yes. and access to yes. The town has a separate and distinct policy in which recreation fees are assessed to all lots um, for a variety of reasons, not necessarily just the neighborhood. So the applicant. So so again, the purpose where I've echoed my comments from earlier about the narrative is really to be able to give the board you're being asked to waive that recreation fee. So I well, think... If that's true, I would like to go on record to saying what I was saying is really, really important. If we're going to waive that, then what is going to be called recreation and acceptable recreation, we need to see. Yes? I mean, yes, it's we, it's I, I feel uncomfortable saying anything you want to call recreation is recreation. So somehow or another, um, I'm not worried about the present people that buy the lots. I'm not worried about the homeowners that are there first time around. I'm worried about down the road. And I would like to see something a little more formal than whatever they want they can have. And I'll leave it to staff to figure out what I mean by that. <laughs> something a little more formal. Other than that, I think we've come a long way. I think it's a very good use of this land. And um, I guess that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Dave? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fustachi, could you go to the podium? <clears throat> I'd like to revisit the uh, affordable housing issue. Uh, you, you threw out a number at the beginning of the meeting, uh, 265, 275, something like that. Yes, uh, based on the sliding scale that was provided to me, with income, family of three with income at a certain level, um, they could afford something in the vicinity of 260, 265,000. I don't have the exact numbers, but it's close close to that. Yeah. And a family of four could afford something like 275. All right. And th those numbers, there is, um, it's available. I, I'll have it next time, <coughs> or I can put it in the packet, but those numbers are available. So if a person came into uh, my office and they wanted a house in this area in Sawgrass, and there was a family of three, single parent with two children, the income, um, uh, their income is somewhere in the vicinity of $80,000. They could qualify for a house for $260,000. $260, that number is something, and I honestly don't know who approves that person for the affordable house. Um, I certainly don't want to qualify the person. I did uh, three in Cape Elizabeth, and the town manager qualified uh, the buyers by taking a look at their income and their their uh, uh, income tax statement. So that's how it was de determined there. I'm assuming it's close. Jay, can you help me out on this one? How, who approves? And and I don't think you've ever had this an affordable house. This is one house. of the difficulties, and this board has experienced it. Yeah. Um, this is one of the difficulties the town has had um, moving forward with affordable housing, which I think is part of the one of the parts of uh, one of the reasons that we've seen a recent amendment to our zoning ordinance to allow for an in lieu fee um, is really the mechanics: how to who's the qualifier. How do you maintain the affordability moving forward through ownership? Is that something we're concerned with? Those, that suite of questions. I know our Housing Alliance, working with the town manager, has been looking at this issue for, for a long time. And so, I, you know, a lot of smart people are working on the issue, and I don't believe it's an easy question. But, um, so, what, it, <coughs> what price range will the other houses be? They'll be somewhere around three hundred thousand dollars. 300, 325, yeah. 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 Uh, so how will, physically speaking, how will this house be different than, 
than the other one? On the exterior, it probably won't be any different at all. Will it be different the, in size? Yes. Uh, not really. No? Not really. It may be a little smaller. I kind of doubt it. Uh, I'm the one, because you're giving me the bonus lot, I'm being subsidized so I can give them basically the same size house for less money. And that's the idea of the program. Right, I'm works. getting a bonus, so therefore I can, uh, you're subsidizing me. And again, I'll I, use I Cape Elizabeth. Think, I think that's basically what it all comes down to. No matter how it's designed, uh, I think affordable housing does come down to somebody being subsidized. Yeah. Uh, by somebody. Yeah. Um, well, in this case, personally, I'll I think the free market is the best. Is the best, you know, judge. Mm -hmm. But um, so the difference isn't all that much between what they would qualify for and what you'll be selling the rest of the house. Um, well. <laughs> I mean, the difference between 275 and, and 300. Well, a lot of people can't afford that neighborhood, so now we're allowing that person to, to afford to be able to move into a new house. And a number of people, I've been building in Scarborough now, well, I've built for several years, but uh, in my Green Acres subdivision, I've had a lot of people ask me, can you build me something for 250? The answer is no, because of the cost of the lots. And so what what did those houses sell for roughly? Um, well, we have one on the market right now at three forty five. Um, the highest one went for two, or the lowest one went for two eighty, and that was two years ago, three years ago now. So that that same house would be in a three hundred dollar price range. My reason for doing this is is I'm just trying to figure out if if it's possible to get there by simply building a smaller house. Than, than the other houses. <coughs> no. No, you can't. Without without the subsidy, yeah. without the the bonus lot, you you can't. Okay. Because there's certain fixed cost, um, the fees that are being assessed, um, impact fees, uh, foundation, kitchens, you know, everything basically same cost the same. No, it's very difficult to build a house in Scarborough brand new construction uh, with a garage for 260 265 it, it's I'm going to say it's next to impossible okay I think you've answered my questions okay. thank you all right thanks Dave um, got a few questions regarding the storm water and maybe mine are a little bit different but <clears throat> Given the fact that this is really our first chance to, to kind of look at this kind of system, and n not that I'm being a naysayer in any way, shape, or form, but my questions have to do with, does anybody else in the area have any of these yet? I mean, you've got them installed, they've been working, how long have they been working, and where? Uh, there's some on uh, that were installed, I think, a year and a half ago in Falmouth on uh, Route 1. There's a section of Route 1. I think there were 13 of them uh, installed. Um, I can certainly provide you with some literature and some pictures of, of those. Um, well, I, 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 my question really kind of stems more from how they're going to function in the wintertime I mean, you know, in the summertime when they're totally exposed and everything's fine, it's a beautiful thing, but good old Maine winters have a tendency to ice things over, snow plows come by, it's going to get buried. How do, you know, does the, does the homeowners association have to make sure these are plowed out, shoveled out so that they work properly in the wintertime? We do get those storms where it's just rain when everything is iced over, frozen, and snow banks are four feet high. Yep. So I'm just trying to figure if they're, they've got kind of this unique flow pattern, if they're buried, how do they work? Yep. These, are, these are very unique. They've been, they've been very successful in both summer and winter conditions in the, in the uh, locations that they've been installed. What you're going to find in the wintertime, 
uh, when you've got a snowbank installed, you know, piled up on top of these, is that the beehive grate will be collecting a lot of the uh, runoff coming off of this. I mean, the uh, bark mulch and uh, filter media material underneath are also there collecting the, the lower storms, you know, the lower flow volumes of water, but the, the significant runoff is going to be making its way through the beehive grate and then in the back into the roadway system. Okay. Um, and it seems kind of interesting that in a higher level storm it flows past the grate. How does that how does that work? If if the the there's a like I said, there's a there's kind of a break in the curb where the, the runoff will go through to this biofiltration system. When the when that area has been pooled up to a certain elevation, water can't continue to go in that way. Okay. So it can't flow into the biofiltration system. It then bypasses it and flows to the catch basin. All right. So it's physically so high enough to have correct. a. There, there's a, if you will, as it comes off the road, it drops into a six-inch deep pool, if you will, where this water builds up and yep. flows into the ground. When that pool gets filled up to six inches, it starts flowing into this overflow, and that's up to the road grade, or four inches below the road grade. So it's built up to this certain level where the water can't continue to flow into it, it then bypasses it and goes to the catch basin. Okay. It, it's the, the, it's design, the, the design is, is done in a way to, to make that happen somewhere between the two and ten year storm. So the two year storm is, is flowing into this system uh, somewhere around the five year storm. A storm that's going to happen once every five years is going to bypass it and flow to the catch basin. Okay. And you've already got your DEP permit with this design? Correct, yes. All right. Yep. I mean, it's, obviously it's unique. It's going to be new to what we're seeing here. And again, as some of my other board members have stated, I mean, if, if we if, we encourage any kind of green um, uh, handling of stormwater. So, and if if I could just mention that the, when when the the issue of the gravel wetland came up with the DEP, it was in fact DEP's recommendation to look into this mm. approach to handle the stormwater. Um, okay. So that's that's where it all started. Is is a recommendation from them that maybe this is here's a new uh, kind of stormwater treatment technique that that were have recently approved, and uh, that's when we started looking at it and, and came, up, came up with a solution. Okay. I think just about everything else on your um, of your concerns has been addressed in one way or another. Um, so we're going to look forward to seeing you clean everything up and yeah, I was, I was kind of hoping with the types of notes and, and wordsmithing and small details we needed. I we think there's a, away with a conditional whole approval. bunch of them, Bill. Yeah, I, I, I think there. trying to condition them at this point would be very, very difficult. And just kind of like to see you clean them up and um, come back. We don't need to make a big production out of it. Um, you have to bring everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that'll be required. Well, Joe didn't want to bring me. So. Uh, <laughs> I think you need to be here. Yeah. Which so, is stormwater management person, maybe not. Okay. Tell, tell Les he's got to come that day. Uh, know, he's so. almost retired now. I hear you. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for your comment. All right, thank you. Our next item this evening is item number six, Foster Farm Subdivision, Habitat for Humanity of Greater Portland requests a preliminary review for a 13-lot subdivision off Broad Turn Road. Mr. Chase. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as just indicated, this application is before the board. Uh, this is your first, uh, actually, no, I take that back. You did see this item as a sketch plan, I believe, back in the springtime, um, but this is the first formal hearing on this item. It is before you for a preliminary review for a subdivision in the VR2 zone. Very similar to what we just uh, reviewed in the VR4 zone um, in terms of having sort of village design uh, uh, development standards. Um, just by way of background, I'm sure the applicant will, can sort of get into this a little bit further, but um, the property, the, the property that we're discussing, is a piece of town-owned land uh, that was purchased by the town. I believe it was in 2006 uh, when the council 
uh, purchased the property, really the, the discussion was around utilizing part of the parcel for affordable housing and maintaining the remainder of the parcel for open space natural areas for town, town usage. So the project before us is really a, a, a sort of a, is the coming together of that vision. Uh, Habitat for Humanity has come on board um, and is, has a memorandum of understanding with the town to proceed with the project. Um, with that, you know, I'll just touch on a few of the items. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in terms of review criteria, uh, the VO, VR2 was adopted by the town with the purpose of allowing for moderate density residential uh, development. It has really five development uh, standards, village development standards, uh, within the zoning ordinance. Um, in terms of the application before us, a couple of the items that um, come to that staff brought brought to the fore in our memo had to do with one of the provisions calls for sidewalks on two sides of the street. The applicant is seeking a waiver for sidewalks on one side of the road. The zoning ordinance does allow for the board to consider such a waiver provided that um, the board finds that sidewalks on both sides aren't necessary due to the nature or scale of development or if other pedestrian amenities are provided for. The other item the applicant is seeking is a waiver of the standard uh, street design uh, standards. <laughs> um, typically, the town requires a 24-foot wide road. There was a bit of uh, 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 confusion in the applicant's submission whether they're seeking a 20-foot or 22-foot wide road. Um, and so I sort of look forward to hearing that discussion, but certainly the board has the ability to waive the standard 24 feet down to 20 feet uh, if you see uh, so see fit to do. Um, the applicant, uh, uh, on the proposed plan, there's uh, some on-street parking which are peculiar. Uh, they sort of cross partly in the public right-of-way, partly not in the right-of-way. They're perpendicular to the street and they don't meet our typical street design standards. So sort of like to understand, uh, have the applicant sort of articulate the needs for those and if there's a way those could be accommodated somewhere else on the site. A um, couple of other items that we questioned um, with regards to the open space. Again, the VR2, as we just talked about in the VR4, the VR2 does require a certain percentage of the land to be sort of this uh, uh, active open space. And there is a an odd open space wedge in the, I guess I'll call it the northwest <coughs> corner behind lots seven and eight. It doesn't really seem to have any real access or utility, so just sort of question what that one's about. Um, and I think, you know, the board is always interested in understanding wetland setbacks and stream setbacks and the nature thereof. Um, what can and can't happen in those? Are they those no disturb or are they allow for limited disturbance. So again, hopefully the applicant is prepared to touch on that. Uh, with that, you will have received comments from Jim Wendell, the town engineer, as well as Woodern Kern, the town's peer review engineer. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I turn it back to you. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Allen, are you going to be addressing this? A In a minute. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? And I'd just like to uh, first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mark Primo. I'm a development associate with Habitat. Um, and I know this has been a, a long time in the works, and I just want to uh, thank you for the, uh, the opportunity to bring this before you. Um, and it's, it's been a great uh, collaboration, in my opinion, between the town, the Housing Alliance, um, and a number of different folks. And uh, we continue to... Uh, be excited about the project, um, and I'd like to turn it over. I know it's been through a, a series of neighborhood meetings and sketch plan, and, um, but I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity, and we'll turn it over to Lee for the uh, technical side of things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Lee Allen with Northeast Civil Solutions. Um, happy to present to you the uh, Habitat for Humanity project off of 75 Broad Turn Road. Um, it's currently on a 19 and a half acre parcel. We're showing development on approximately five and a half acres. That's where the stream wetland 
kind of bisects the property. Um, we are proposing 1,200 lineal feet of road off of Broad Turn Road, and it loops back on itself. We're proposing to reduce the width from 24 feet to 22 feet. Um, I think some of the confusion has come that Jim Wendell and I have had conversation back and forth as to what is an acceptable width with curbing on both sides of the road, and I think we've seen some developments in town that have curbing with 20 feet of road and, and felt it just felt too tight. So um, we're proposing 22 feet with curbing on both sides. Um, and that is one of the waivers that Jay mentioned that we are requesting. The open space. Um, that wedge behind lot seven and eight, um, can kind of explain the black story to that. Originally, um, it, we were out there walking the site and noticed it's very loud. It's very close to the turnpike. Um, there's actually some criteria that we need to meet through FHA, or we met the FHA. The community, community Development Block Grant required us that we meet some certain loud um, noise threshold. In order to do that, we originally thought we were going to build a berm and plant the berm to reduce the noise on the site. Um, we went through a noise study. Um, I say Habitat went through the noise study with the town. Uh, the results of that noise study said, well, if you build a fence, stockade fence, um, on this property and that configuration as we're showing behind lot seven and eight, those back property corners, um, that is going to effectively meet the noise reduction that you need to meet for this property to qualify for the CDBG grant. So instead of a berm, we're now facing we just need to build um, a fence. So that area was originally intended to, we were going to get some property from the Maine Turnpike Authority allowance to us to build a berm onto their property and across the back corner. Long story short is we can extend that property line back and we can make that little wedge go away and it will become part of lot seven and eight. It was just there from a previous iteration of this design. Um, so that, that portion will go away. We will include an easement between lot seven and eight and then along behind lot seven, six, five, and four to provide access to that fence um, so that the homeowners association can repair that in, in the future when, when the need arises. Um, I believe we're also talking about waivers for reduction of sidewalk. We have shown sidewalk on one side. Um, there's a couple of reasons we're looking for that reduction. One is the site is relatively small. We don't believe there's going to be a lot of pedestrian traffic. But the second and probably most important is having a sidewalk on both sides of the road as it's coming in is going to put more pedestrians closer to the neighbors. And one of the big things we're trying to do with this project is provide a vegetative and landscape buffer between the existing neighborhood off of Saratoga and this proposed development. Um, so when Kevin gets a chance to get up here and speak, he'll take you kind of through what we're doing to you know, enhance that vegetative buffer between the uh, residences and, and our proposed development. Um, permitting, we are going to need a DEP stormwater permit. Um, that's in process. It's, it's being reviewed by DEP as we speak. Um, we're also going to need a permit by rule for activities that we're proposing between 75 feet and 25 feet of the wetlands as shown on the plan. Um, it's a relatively straightforward permit. It usually takes, you know, it's two week review turnaround time. Um, we're kind of trying to get everything finalized before we, we get to the point where we submit for that. And, you know, obviously we have some activities that are within that zone that we do need a permit for. Uh, the project will be served by Municipal Water from the Portland Water District. There's existing eight inch uh, water main in Broad Turn Road. We are going to tie into that. And the Water District does have plans of ours right now that they're reviewing. Um, sewer. Um, in case you haven't heard, there's ongoing um, sewer, off-site sewer project. Uh, bids, I believe, are due tomorrow. Um, so that project has been funded by a community development block grant. Uh, it is anticipated that project will be completed this fall. So the sewer line will be there for us to tap into um, before we get underway. Um, in meetings with the Sanitary District, we're going to use uh, low-pressure sewer. It, it's similar to sewer systems that we've used on other projects. Basically, each house will be equipped with an 
injector pump that ties into a common force main that will pump up to a manhole that's located in Rod Turn Road. The site will be served with underground utilities. We'll tie into a pole that's uh, right near our site, run utilities, underground um, transformers with every couple, two or three lots to serve each of the homes. And finally, it's stormwater. We're going to collect stormwater from the road and the houses in a closed drain system, a catch basin, some pipe, and pipe it to a underdrain filter. Um, the underdrain filter is sized mostly for uh, the road runoff. The homes will be treated with drip edge filters. Um, that's uh, crushed stone along the drip edges of each um, side of the roof, and the water basically falls into the rock, is filtered, and is collected in a smaller pipe system that is then <coughs> diverted around our underdrain filter and eventually outletted into the wetland um, complexes behind our site. I believe that's all I have. I'm going to turn it over to Kevin uh, from Garan. He can talk about the landscaping. Hi, I'm Kevin from Garland Turgeon. Um, yeah, I think one of the items, too, that Lee may not have mentioned, but it, uh, with regards uh, to the driveways, I think that was brought up before, but those are not shown right now, and I think what we talked about is that we can show a typical detail in our drawings, but the driveway locations are dependent on the model type that the owner, the homeowner, chooses. There are several different models. Um, and their orientation on site, so the driveway locations are not f are not fixed yet. Um, in terms of street trees, uh, right now we're proposing two different types, uh, 23 in total, along 1,200 plus or minus uh, square or linear feet of road. That works out to be one every 46 feet. Uh, it's a it's a fairly typical spacing. Uh, the trees that we're proposing are one's a maple hybrid and the other one is a, a white ash. Those are both on your approved, you know, your list of approved uh, plant materials. The buffering, the, the evergreen buffering and the existing vegetative buffer that Lee mentioned. And the fence that Lee mentioned uh, that was done to adhere to the sound study. You can see that that's going to go along here, here, and here. And as Lee mentioned, this portion will be divvied up between these two parcels, I think. And the fence will be dealt with. I think that's all I have right now, so uh, we'll just open it up to you guys for any questions. All right. Before I uh, pass this along to the board, this is the uh, opportunity that we have for public comment. If there is anybody here um, who would like to make public comment on this item, please feel free to approach the podium, state your name and address for the record. We ask that you try to keep your comments to five minutes or less. So if anybody would like to comment. Now would be the time. Okay. Uh, seeing none, I will, in fact, turn it over to the board. Dave? Uh, I think I'm all set. Okay. Thank you. Susan? Yay. <laughs> We waited a long time for something like this, and I think it's been a wonderfully collaborative event. Um, I'm proud of Scarborough, 
and I'm proud of um, you folks, and I hope that this turns out to be everything you want it to be. Um, I appreciate the fact that you're taking um, the folks on Saratoga under consideration and changing some of your original thoughts in order to provide as much um, buffering as possible. I'm a little confused about uh, if we can take that one down. Thank you. And then we go to, okay. So the actual boundary line of the land that is going to belong to the um, subdivision versus what's going to continue to be owned by the town of Scarborough. Is that clear on that map? It is not, and I appreciate you picking that up. It's actually a discussion that is kind of ongoing with the town. It is, okay. Um, it, it's, I wish I could say it's very easy. We could just do this. It's, it's a little more confusing, but it's something that we are working on, and the anticipated line is to follow that stream and kind of split that wetland. Okay. And it, that's roughly five and a half acres. And that the only reason I really am asking is because of the open space designation, and the question as to the open space being within the confines of the development versus the obvious open space of the land that will continue to belong to Scarborough. Um, you know, the, the, the corner, mm. the corner that's going to be, that was going to be open space is actually not going to be open space now. It's going to be owned by <coughs> two Correct. owners with a fence. And I understand how that's going to work. But designated open space within the development um, it looks like from here, if I look at lots, what, I can't read my thing, uh, five, six, seven, across the, um, no, no, I'm sorry, one, two, and three. Yeah, okay. So at this point, the property goes to the red dotted line. To the potential, the pink line. The pink line. The rest of it, this is open space. Okay. All right. Yep, community area. Is that going to be a, um, oh, God, it's getting late. My mind is just goes blank. Homeowners Association type thing with this? Yes. So there will be something that, set, that talks about what that inner open yes. space shall be used for will be yep, included at, in this? Yep. At this point, it's anticipated to be a, a grass lawn area for okay. recreation for kids to play on. Just want to make sure that something is written up at some point that includes that. Um, I'm so happy with the underground utilities, yes. Um, and, and the trees, every 46 feet or whatever that was, seems to me to be um, really great. When it comes time, when this whole thing about exactly where is the line between this property and the town, is, the, the property the town is going to maintain is determined. Something I would like to think, if it doesn't already exist, needs to be needs to exist in terms of um, trails, whatever that go through and connect, because that open space back there that's going to continue to be owned by Scarborough is um, pretty good land for hiking and cross-country skiing. Well, not much cross-country and all that woods. But anyway, it leads us to the um, power lines, right? Doesn't it go down to the... It, I don't know if it gets all the way to it, it or not. Does it go all that way down? I don't believe it, it makes I don't think it gets all the way down there. It doesn't go all that way. No. no. Okay. There's so it's um, basically just trails. Yep, and okay. there's there's open space, town-owned open space at the end of Saratoga Lane that okay. this is contiguous to. Um, so yeah, that's all that's owned by the conservation by the, by the land trust. That's owned by the land trust. This is owned by the town of Scarborough. So we have a lot of contiguous yeah. open space. So anything that can be done to provide some kind of trail, even in theory, would be really great. Um, I'm very impressed with the. Um, elevations that are going to be offered. I'm not sure what kind of uh, materials you're going to use, but this is early on in the process. I can pretty much tell from the sketches that you've given what they're going to look like. Um, I don't have any problems with any of that. Um, I just think this is a, a great program, and um, I'm proud of having something to do with it. Thank you.
Thank you, Susan. Ron? Yeah, let me go over the open space again with me. Can we please? Sure. So this triangle piece in the back. Okay. It doesn't make sense to have it. It isn't good for real purpose. It's going to become part of Lost Town in Maine. So right now, what we're doing is open space. It starts up here at Broad Turn Road. This area right here. It's going to be this area. And we're anticipating that, that great line between this project and the town on land is going to be something like that. Where's the actual road then, Foster Way? Okay, so below that is open space too? Yeah. Okay, and how are pedestrians going to, that's where I get a little confused. This yellow is the sidewalk right here. Uh huh. It comes and moves back around this way. Okay. If I might, just one thing to think of, I think, you know, if we're sort of talking in terms of, or I'm hearing anyway, um, in terms of sort of five and a half acres. The parcel itself is 19 plus or minus acres that we're talking about. So really the, the net residential density on this, I think as the board's thinking about this, maybe future plans could at least have a sheet that help yes. depict this, that really we're looking at a 19 acre parcel. And really what we're looking at is like we do with other subdivisions that have open space, there's going to be, there's going to be, uh, so that leaves us with 14 acres of open space. Now that open space is going to have two different types of ownership. There's going to be a homeowners association that owns, sounds like maybe that, that open space uh, along the road and where the stormwater facilities are. And the town will wind up owning, continuing to own, uh, you know, the back, let's call it 10 acres be on the other side of the stream. So one thing that we may want to be thinking about in all of this is sort of providing that connection between the development site and the remaining open space. Because again, as we talked about, the VR2 has their village um, development mm -hmm. standards and it talks about having connectivity of open space. Again, getting to this notion of having active open space in lieu of, or in part and parcel because lots are smaller, you don't have as much yard space to play and you know, sort of do the things that maybe you would on larger lots. So thinking about how we can sort of use that open space uh, to everyone's benefit, so to speak. So, yeah. and, um, and if I could add to that, as a discussion that we've been having internally, as, as part of discussion and of eliminating one side, you know, sidewalks on only one side of the road, we're going to be applying for a permit by rule anyway. Part of the permit by rule process can be we can add to it is to provide or show a detail for a, a crossing over that stream to get access to that back mm -hmm. 14 acres. Um, another issue that I read about, uh, and I know you're asking for a waiver in the street width, but in asking for that waiver, uh, the ability of heavy and emergency vehicles to be able to travel down, has that been taken into consideration? Uh, absolutely. It, it would work with a 20-foot width, but it feels very confining. That's why we're proposing 22 feet. It, it works better with 22. Okay. And I didn't hear an answer about parking spaces. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, <laughs> um, I, that's a, we don't need them. We were originally proposing them um, as some sort of maybe overflow parking, maybe kind of trailhead public access to the, the back part of the, the property. I could turn that back to the board and say, what would you guys prefer to do? I mean, we can eliminate them totally. We can have, you know, parallel parking that's, that's gravel up beyond the, the curbing, um, if that's the wish of the board. Um, we can take some of the open space and, and turn that into a, a parking area that's entirely in our property, if that's what you just prefer. I'm guessing that the two to three parking spaces kind of parallel up over the curb, make the curb easily mountable and get some gravel area or some pervious grass, you know, grass pavement, the grass paved system. That might be a, a smart way to go about it. What is on the map between three and four that there shows actually uh, on, the in, on the inside? Those, those little, what, is that not parking? This right here? No, on the inside of the road. There's like four little... Oh, that's, that's, that's parking over there. Could that be used for what we're talking about? The, the issue, I believe, is 
that that goes against the ordinance for backing out into a public street, and we'd need to change yes. that to parallel or to put it entirely within the open space because it Less would then become. Well, that's coming right. up. The design, yeah. the design as shown is problematic. We could certainly right. work, okay. you know. And the I space, think, yeah, sorry. The space between three and four is to provide access? Correct. There is some access there. There is also, um, if you look at your topo plan, there's a fairly deep ravine there, and we're trying to stay away from it. That's why we, we left the lots not adjoining each other. We left some room there. Sorry to jump in. Excuse me. No, that's fine. That's good. Um, there's also been some questions about some of the setbacks. Is, are they being addressed? Yeah, and we don't foresee that as an issue at all. Okay. And finally, lighting. There was questions on lighting. We've had that talk, and that's gone round and round. We will propose a Cobra light at the intersection of Broad Turn and the proposed road, Foster Way, or Foster Farm Way. Um, other than that, we are going to be putting post lamps up on each lot, but we're not proposing any internal um, street lighting other than post lamps. Okay. That's about all I have right now. Okay. Thanks, Ron. John? Oh, you guys are doing a great job. It saved me a lot of work. The only one I've got is the easement that Jim's looking for between lot one and two uh, for access to your stormwater pond. Yes. Is there another way to do that without chopping up uh, lot one and two? We're, lo we're looking at that. We're looking at trying to find a, a way to get back there that's, that's better than what we've shown. Can we do it on this, on the property line to the east? This side? Yes. That, again, this is stepping back. We've had several neighborhood meetings with um, the folks from Saratoga Lane, um, and the wish has always been to provide a substantial residential vegetative buffer between the two developments. So if we put it there, we're losing width of buffer. So that's why we've proposed it um, off the end of lot three. I guess you to work with Jim. Do you, Jay, do you think we really need a 30-foot buffer and 30-foot access, or could we do a 10 or 15? The easement? Is easement, yeah. Uh, I would defer to Jim, but that's our that's the typical yeah. easement width. The road fits within that, so it provides the town the ability to. It's. I mean. Yeah, it's just for maintenance, and that's not yeah. going to happen for 10 years or more. It's just a matter of yeah. getting an excavator or a. It, it is the typical. I, I'd agree with Jay to get a yeah. truck and a backhoe and or whatever you need to do the work. And then if any work needs to be done to that, you know, because the roadway itself is ostensibly only going to be 10 feet. And what that provides is 10 feet on either side. So if work needs to be done, you don't have to then go try to get permission from the landowner who could say, well, nope, I'm not okay. going to give you permission to fix Good. this thing. So right. that's the I'm okay with the 30 foot other than that. And this is all about cost, obviously for habitat. So I have no problem with the sidewalks just on one side. And again, I was on the Housing Alliance. This has progressed a long ways from twice as many units to many neighborhood associations, they've done a good job. Positive here. Thanks, John. Corey? Thank you. And um, I'm also glad to see this at this point and, and glad to see the town taking such an affirmative role on something like this. Uh, most of my questions have been addressed um, in the previous discussion. I'm, I'm okay with the, uh, the waiver for the 22-foot the, uh, uh, street width. Uh, I'm also okay with the waiver for uh, allowing just the, the sidewalk on just one side of the street, given the size and configuration of the, in the, of the neighborhood and the, the buffer consideration that was pointed out. It's a pretty compelling rationale. Um, I guess I would tend to agree that the, um, the parallel parking feels a little awkward and kind of needs to be fleshed out, potentially relocated. Um, and uh, beyond that, I think, like I said, everything's been covered and look forward to seeing it progress. All right, thanks, Corey. <coughs> uh, uh, sure. Uh, can I ask a couple Absolutely. Uh, just two questions. Uh, <clears throat> why that lot in the middle of the circle, uh, which is designated as open space, why isn't that being an additional house lot? That's a good question. <laughs> there's, 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 it is not because we have more than enough density. Um, I think it was a feeling of 
you, you're starting to try to jam too much in there, and that that gives you a sense of if you're if you're living across the street or or next door, it gives you a sense of there is a place for kids to go and play, and and I think it worked a lot better without having another house in there. It just looked right. It looked like if you're trying to put a house there, it looked like we were trying to jam too much into it. I think it was more of just a feel of of how it was, and and honestly with the the, the model, the habitat model, we really didn't need that extra house in there, and that was something that the neighbors were also appreciative of, of not having this. I mean, it, as John mentioned, this this used to be a much bigger project. It used to be, we were talking at one point, 23, 26 homes or something like that. So we've almost cut it in half. But I, I don't think I can point to one specific reason. I, I, I was just curious, uh, you know, it would be another opportunity for another family, that's all. Well, I think and I wasn't really part of the neighborhood meeting process, but in much like the previous um, subdivision we saw, the, this or the VR2 also requires that 10 to 20 percent of the open space be active open space, be lawn area. Again, sort of to the notion that these lots aren't going to have much lawn area to play catch in. So to provide that area, um, and so my guess is sort of the design, the early sketch plans design team came up with how are we going to incorporate this notion of active open space into the plan. And um, so that's likely where, where that came from. Um, but, but I think, you know, there, there is a requirement that 10 to 20 percent of the open space or of the net, I'm sorry, I should say 10 to 20 percent of the net residential area be allocated uh, for sort of this active open space that's re it talks about it being readily accessible sort of in the heart of the neighborhood. Um, and so that's likely the language that precipitated the, the location. Um, maybe that it could be served elsewhere. You know, one of, maybe one of the lots on the outside maybe could serve that same purpose and address some of the parking issues. I, you know, these are things we could at least well, consider and explore. I was just curious because, you know, looking at it, it looks like there's something missing. I understand. Uh, my other question is about the uh, the first time home buyers. Will there be any preferential treatment as far as uh, Scarborough residents? Or uh, we have uh, worked with the uh, the alliance. So the way this this whole deal is structured is that at least five of the uh, um, units. Uh, are called alliance units, uh, and those uh, we are talking with the housing alliance right now about what that criteria is for for them. So we haven't put together the exact criteria, um, and I don't I don't know what the legalities are of preferential preferential treatment for Scarborough residents versus not uh, you know non-residents, um, but there they'll certainly be marketed towards uh, you know Scarborough uh, residents. Um, and I think a lot of this, what we're going to find is that when we come and start actually building these units and fundraising and involving community members, we're going to, I think we're going to find a lot of um, uh, Scarborough residents that uh, may be looking for affordable places. Yeah. Uh, this has be an option for them, workforce housing, if you will. Okay. Yeah. Just curious. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Um, Mr. Allen. Keep you bouncing back up and down. I think that um, Dave's question maybe is a great answer to many things that we've talked about tonight. Consider, if you will, that instead of having the open space on the inside of the circle, you put a house there and then use either lot one, two, or four as the open space, which then gives you access, your easement to the back. It gives you room to move your parking so that you can get it off the street. It gives you an opportunity to have a play area where balls are less apt to go into a street. And it keeps the number of houses the same. But if you just take, you know, 
You could take any one of those, actually, lots one through four, yep. flip it into the circle, and solve all the problems that we've talked about. Just a thought. Um, my other question is, and, and I will also comment on the fact I don't have a problem with the 22-foot uh, wide street. I think that's fine. I don't have a problem with the two sidewalks. The one thing I do question in terms of the sidewalks is, and I understand why, I get it, but if you actually want to have a sidewalk more functional in terms of protecting the most amount of people, you need to put the sidewalk on the other side of the street of the circle. So as you're coming in off the road, you turn down the street to the left and cover the maximum amount of lots that you can if your intent is to really provide a little more walkable space. Um, and, you know, I understand you don't want to do the full thing on both sides, but you could almost make a circle of sidewalks so that people could actually walk the neighborhood safely. Consider that. Um, and I think outside of that, we've addressed just about everything that, that I wanted to see um, addressed this evening. And then obviously, any crosswalks that you might do in the event that you actually do change the sidewalk configuration, I'd like to see as well. Can't imagine why I would say that. Anything okay. else for us? I believe that's it. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, it looks great. As we said at the last last time you were here, really glad to see this happening. Mm -hmm. I think it's an excellent project for the town and very, very pleased that it's coming in front of us. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Our next item this evening is the town planner's report. Mr. Chase. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could just find my paperwork, I do have a couple of items to report. I may have to wing it. <laughs> Let's see. I can tell you what. <laughs> uh, a couple of items. One, just to remind the board that we have a couple of joint workshops with the council coming up on Wednesday, the 17th, 17th this coming Wednesday. Actually, I shouldn't say a couple of workshops. So we have one workshop beginning at 6 p.m. This is really the beginning of a discussion with the folks at Piper Shores. Uh, it's really, a, as I said, a workshop, informal discussion to hear some concepts they have uh, that they may be considered moving forward uh, that may uh, lend to a contract zone amendment. Um, so uh, that, that item begins at 6 p.m. and it's a workshop. Beginning at 7 p.m. as part of the council's regular agenda, there will be a joint hearing of the board and the council, this board and the council, for a contract zone to establish a contract zone, uh, it's really a, it's, it's a, a joint effort between the University of New England and the uh, uh, Army Corps National Guard, or I'm sorry, Army National Guard, to create a readiness center um, along the Saco town line, uh, down Route One, um, on a piece of par uh, piece of land uh, down there, um, and that is a formal hearing, um, and so I just want to. You know, let folks in the audience know and remind the board of those items, and you should have received some uh, uh, information on Dropbox in, in regards to those two things. Um, the two others, I, I stalled long enough to have them come to mind, was uh, one, just update, uh, actually two, two updates on, I believe it was last Monday, there was uh, SEDCO, Scarborough Economic Development Corporation, has really taken the charge of uh, working on a Dunstan revitalization plan, furthering the work that we did with the Sustained Southern Main Group about a year ago, maybe a little longer, um, really trying to take that regional plan and make it a more localized plan. Um, and so there was a, a uh, meeting, as I said last Monday, uh, Mr. DuPont and Mr. Fellows were able to attend. Um, I thought it was well attended, and there will be a report that's generated and presented to the council, I believe, on October 1st. The other item, uh, again, this was going about two weeks ago, there was a joint 
workshop between this board and the council regarding wireless uh, telecommunication facilities, cell towers. Um, a lot of good comments generated out of that. Again, Mr. DuPont was able to make it, as was Mr. Paul. And um, uh, let's see, so staff is working with our consultant and will be preparing uh, revised uh, language for council consideration, I believe, on October 1st as well. Um, so those were the four items that I want to bring to the board's attention this evening. All right, thank you. Administrative amendment report. I have one item to report at 95 Pleasant Hill, ABCO uh, received administrative approval for a ostensibly a storage building on their site, a site that sort of hidden down off the, um, the uh, bridge going over the railroad tracks. Um, sort of hard to see down in there <laughs> in the industrial zone. Um, and so that received its administrative approval a couple weeks ago. Uh, correspondence, anyone? Planning board comments. Just briefly say that I, uh, as Jay mentioned, um, a couple of us attended the last Monday's workshop. I was unable to attend the one week before that, but um, thought it was a really productive discussion, kind of trying to make the transition from more of a charrette type conversation to getting more specific about how, how, when, and whether <laughs> to do more to actually help uh, bring some of those visions to fruition. And um, I think the workshops in general are a great idea. I think it um, helps to really um, foster some good discussion and, and things don't get lost in translation sort of between the different boards and the council. And also, you know, they're open to the public and I think that helps with transparency and uh, hopefully there'll be more of those as as uh, the needs arise. Uh, I also want to personally thank Mr. DuPont for coming to the cell tower meeting. Um, he had some very good information that he provided at that meeting that I think uh, was of interest to members of the council and um, <clears throat> appreciate him bringing that, that forward. Um, in terms of the meeting that's coming up on Wednesday evening, I would like to encourage and urge uh, as many of you to attend that particular one as possible, um, mainly because it is twofold. It's not just a workshop, but it really is. It's, a, it's the public hearing that um, we are involved with along with the town council. It's a joint public hearing that we hold uh, regarding um, the item that's in front of us. So. Um, because of the contract zone. So I really would like to encourage as many board members uh, possible to get there. I know some of you can't. I appreciate that. Um, but if you can, that would be great if we can have a good showing at that meeting. Um, so I'll just, uh, based on the responses to email, I know we will have a quorum. We may have five, but I know we'll at least have four. Yeah. I counted and double counted, just to be <laughs> sure. So. Uh, All right, so that that'll be great. Yep. That uh, you know we've got that kind of attendance. I appreciate that. So, uh, having said that, um, I will entertain entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. We have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a second, Mr. Dupont. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? And we are adjourned. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>